Greetings, this is Jan Spencer in Eugene, Oregon. And this is the third part of a three-part Zoom series, creating a preferred future. This one, this uh, third part, I'm using the word literacy. Literacy is a powerful word and we'll, uh, we'll move a little bit deeper into literacy shortly. This is the third part of the three-part series. The previous two presentations are now on YouTube and you can see the YouTube uh, URL for those presentations. The contents, we'll talk about literacy. Why are we here? Footprints, priorities, allies, and assets. And we wanna focus on positive stories from the frontier of the preferred future, a little bit Eugene, Portland, further afield, and we'll take a look at some great examples of pushing back on cars. And then of course, multiple benefits to be gained by moving towards a preferred future. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, my ideal society, would exist within its environmental boundaries, would bring out the best and positive human potential, would embrace economic and political democracy and restore the natural world. And a, a wonderful point of departure, the wisdom of the world's great spiritual traditions could be the platform both for a society and a civilization but also for a person's own individual lifestyle, the wisdom of the world's great spiritual traditions, care for the natural world, modesty of lifestyle, service to the community, personal and social uplift, responsibility and accountability for our own actions. Literacy, for a preferred present and future. Literacy uh, in terms of social, historical, lifestyle, economic, and environmental concerns as used here means far more than being able to read and write. Creating a healthy, peaceful, uplifted, sustainable future calls on much more uh, skill than being able to read and write. Those skills include understanding the declining condition of our planet and human experience, understanding the part people in their own lives play in contributing to the decline of the human condition, understanding the potentials and the parts we can all play, and of course, many already in repairing the damage in terms of lifestyle, economics, culture, environment, and the future. And these pictures all show different aspects of uh, literacy, permaculture I include, uh, empowered youth, uh, recognizing the opportunities all around us, uh, education, social dynamics, civic culture, learning from each other's experience, and for many of these examples of literacy, there is no need for policy or permission for people to take action in their own lives, homes, and neighborhoods. So why are we here? Good question. I've gone into more detail about capitalism in other presentations uh, on YouTube that I have. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on uh, a critique of capitalism at this time, but just to give you a little bit of an idea where I'm coming from. Uh, we all have acquaintance with the, the failures of capitalism in terms of social, political, economic disequity, uh, pollution to the environment uh, as an external cost of a dishonest economic system. The urban environment uh, is a 
product of capitalism, a dispiriting urban environment, climate change, trillions of dollars spent to repair the damage caused by capitalism. These are just a few. And this is why I'm here. A, an important aspect of, of where we are now as a society and a culture and as individuals uh, is in terms of ecological footprint. Uh, there's an, uh, we've all aware of the term ecological footprint. Uh, what is the impact we have on the planet? Uh, some would uh, define that term footprint in a way of how many planet Earth would it take for people to live a particular lifestyle. Uh, the Global Footprint Network has determined that for everybody in the world to live like the average American, we would need five planets. Is that a sacred statistic? Perhaps not, but it certainly gives us a good idea. This map shows the ecological footprints around the world. I myself have traveled a good deal and I've been in every color on this map. Uh, Latin America, Africa, Europe, New Zealand. Uh, I've been in every color on this map and I can certainly verify that the expression of sizable ecological footprints is the greatest, is the largest in the United States right here where we live. So moving towards a preferred future and gaining a sense of personal literacy is getting an idea, some of our own personal ecological footprint. And this is a calculator online. It's called uh, the footprint calculator. You can go to this place here and the calculator is a series of questions about your own lifestyle. You answer these questions about uh, your diet, transportation, your living situation, what you buy. And at the end of this 12, 14 minute survey, then uh, the calculator will tell you how many planet Earths would be needed for everybody in the world to live like you. Could be a little bit of a shock. Again, the average American, about five, uh, some people less, some people a whole lot more. But gaining a sense of our own footprint is uh, an important, a vital, a critical point of departure for making uh, adjustments in our own lifestyles and hopefully uh, in the lifestyle collectively of our entire society. This picture is just a, a comparison of the consumer culture and what a more, I don't know if I would say sustainable, but at least moving in that direction, uh, what we have now and what a uh, moving towards a more preferred future could look like. And I'll just give a couple examples. We live in an automobile dependent society and a preferred future would be far more walkable, far much uh, more uh, usable transit bikes. Uh, our cities would be designed so that what we need is more accessible. There'd be less need for mobility. Uh, a remodeled kitchen. Uh, instead of a remodeled kitchen, we would uh, instead spend that money on uh, edible landscaping, rainwater systems, permaculture applied to where we live at home and in our neighborhoods. Uh, you can pause the YouTube presentation here and you can take a closer look at uh, this comparison. So another really important uh, approach movement towards a preferred future uh, that I go into more detail elsewhere, uh, other presentations is what do we do with our own time and money? Uh, we 
uh, invest our own time and money in products and actions that move us towards a preferred future. This is really critical. I do this every day here on my own property. And again, here is an example I just mentioned a moment ago about the remodeled kitchen up here instead of spending that money essentially to a large degree on a vanity project then here are some of the uh, other choices we can make that help us reduce our ecological footprints help uh, our own preparedness our own resilience uh, move us towards a preferred future social literacy also includes improving our capacity to recognize allies and assets and opportunities where we live. That can be our own lives, what we have here in our own homes, turning a front yard, grassy front yard into a garden, uh, turning a, uh, uh, making common cause with faith communities and all kinds of organizations that we find nearby in the neighborhood where we live. Uh, we have an enormous opportunity to make common cause with other entities uh, for helping uh, take us all towards a preferred future. I've mentioned permaculture. Uh, permaculture is a powerful set of ideals and principles that can operate at multiple scale, produce multiple benefits. Uh, permaculture is a great tool to help us move towards a preferred future. You can find a lot about permaculture online. Search permaculture, uh, YouTube, there's lots of videos explaining permaculture. And this is uh, another important opportunity to uh, be more literate and use effectively in a positive way what's available to us. Almost any city has a neighborhood watch program. Any city has emergency preparedness. Many cities have a program called Map Your Neighborhood. These are all great programs and they have a wonderful uh, intention of use but when we become more literate about uh, our, our current historical condition and what can be done about it, we can recognize all of these programs that almost any city offers. We can use these programs in a much more ambitious way, not only to uh, 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 move towards the ideals of these programs, but to expand the, the potentials for what these programs can accomplish. For example, uh, emergency preparedness. Emergency preparedness education should include permaculture and permaculture features on a property like rainwater catchment. Permaculture features like developing local food sources, reducing our ecological footprints, turning a, a large grassy front yard into a garden, site tours. Um, all of these uh, city programs could more fully advance their mainstream cause by adding to their outreach these types of actions people can take that make them more uh, prepared, but also more resilient and help move us towards a, uh, a preferred future. This is a really nice little graphic that I made. I'm sure other people have put together something like this, assets, allies, and actions. And each two of these points of the triangle working together enhance the third, and that can be in any combination. Assets and actions can create more allies. Allies and actions can create more assets. This is kind of a virtuous, uh, triangle of, uh, of social uh, dynamic that can expand our sense of literacy, uh, show us uh, how we can be more effective uh, with our own time and money 
by uh, practicing and, and participating in this type of virtuous triangle. So let's see a little bit of what some of these ideals and principles look like on the ground in real life. This is a part of uh, my neighborhood, uh, the River Road neighborhood here in Eugene. This yellow rectangle is my quarter acre suburban property. And these uh, fuchsia colored rectangles, these are all nearby properties that uh, are friendly to permaculture, and most of them have a lot of permaculture features, uh, some similar to my own and some that uh, I don't have on my property. So for example, this is a full acre, a long narrow rectangle, just to give you a sense of scale right here. And of course, that uh, yellow is a quarter acre property. This is a schematic of my own property. This over here is the, the north side. This is the south side. And I have all kinds of edible landscaping. This is the house, the sunroom, a built and detached structure uh, in the backyard. This is actually where I am sitting right here. But this project is because of my own uh, very grateful sense of, of literacy of what could be done with a suburban property. When I bought this place 20 years ago, the intention from the beginning was to do a permaculture makeover. This is what my property looked like 20 years ago, a nothing special mid 50s small suburban house. And this is what the, the place looks like uh, in the summertime with this edible landscaping, um, I took out my driveway. This is where my driveway used to be. I recognized lots of opportunities to make better use of what I have as my own personal asset, this quarter acre suburban property. This is the backyard. It was just a grassy backyard. And uh, this is what the, the same view is in the summertime at this point, biodiversity. This is the structure that I built in the backyard. This is looking towards the south right here. In other presentations, I go into more detail describing what I've done here uh, on my suburban property. I also have a 30 minute video tour on YouTube of my place as well, links on my website. Another great benefit that I discovered only after I've been working on my property transformation was it's an enormously important educational resource for the community. Literally thousands of people have visited my place over the years to see what suburbia can look like. So let's uh, expand our, uh, our, our tour here uh, into a few other locations in the neighborhood. We're only going to go to a few because we don't have time to go everywhere. But let's start out with my next door neighbor. This was a, a laurel hedge that was right on our property line. We both agreed we wanted to take out the laurel hedge and replace it with edible landscaping. The hedge was right on the property line. We couldn't do this uh, on our own. Both my neighbor and I had to collaborate and work together to take out this hedge, and we did. And uh, we both have uh, edible landscaping on our respective sides of that hedge. This is a little park right down the street, and this is a, a good location we've used to stage bike tours. We uh, meet at the park and then we go visit different properties in the neighborhood and talk with the people who uh, have those properties so they can tell us what they're doing. These are great fun uh, permaculture site tours. Uh, we've had site tours ranging from five people to 60 to 70 people to go around the neighborhood because everybody can, can learn from what others have been doing on their properties. 
this location is just a couple blocks away. Uh, my good friend Ravi and his wife Michelle moved in uh, only a year after I did, and they uh, their intention was to uh, create a a very small center for education uh, and uplift social and spiritual uplift. Just my luck, they moved in a block away. I didn't know them; they didn't know me, uh, and this has been. Uh, a, a place where we've had over the years all kinds of great events to learn about creating a preferred future. This is wonderful. Ravi and Michelle had the literacy to recognize the opportunity, the potentials for this uh, three quarter acre property just a couple blocks away. And this is another property just a few blocks away. <clears throat> This is that long uh, one acre rectangle I pointed out earlier. This is that property uh, in the early going. Uh, this property was overgrown with blackberries. Over the years, we've had many work parties to, uh, to bring this uh, property into uh, a much more productive condition uh, garden. It's a little eco village now. We've had all kinds of events uh, at this location over the years because people recognized an opportunity and had the literacy to take action to manifest that opportunity. Another important tool that uh, many neighborhoods have, many cities have neighborhood programs. Uh, in Eugene, there are about 25 neighborhoods, and most of them have a neighborhood association. The neighborhood association exists to address the issues in the neighborhood that uh, can be addressed, that uh, can improve the quality of life in the neighborhood. It could be traffic, could be homelessness, could be the environment. Uh, could be crime. Uh, every neighborhood has issues, and the neighborhood association uh, exists to address those issues. And when people are involved with their neighborhood association, they can help identify what issues the neighborhood association is interested in. Typically, a neighborhood association has committees, and different people can choose committees initiate a committee to address some uh, concern that they have. A neighborhood association can empower people, and it's a platform for getting uh, important information and actions out to the wider neighborhood so more people can participate. Another great uh, asset we have in my neighborhood and many other neighborhoods have also is a community center, a recreation center. We have one here in River Road. It's uh, about an eight minute bike ride from my house. Lots of neighborhoods have rec centers, have community centers, and those community centers have, uh, have the infrastructure for having events. And if people want to have a permaculture convergence at the neighborhood recreation center, well, they can do that because that's exactly what we did in 2015. We hosted the 2015 Northwest Permaculture Convergence here in our suburban neighborhood. Uh, this is the registration. This is one of about 40 workshops. Uh, we had site tours all around the neighborhood. We had a big expo. Uh, fun uh, is a big part of the convergence. Um, this is a, a, a wonderful use of an existing asset. We estimate 700 people took part in the, uh, in the convergence. Much of the convergence was free to the community. Uh, a, uh, a recreation center can be a wonderful resource for reaching out to the wider community. We have uh, another location in our neighborhood, 
and almost any neighborhood has something that can use some attention uh, in terms of improving the neighborhood with a, a physical location. That physical location can bring a lot of people together. It could be a community garden, could be something uh, uh, environmental restoration, could be something cultural. Almost any neighborhood has uh, projects uh, in need that can bring people together to build community, to build uh, civic literacy. And the Greenway is a place in River Road. Uh, this is the Willamette River, and this is the east side of our neighborhood. And uh, this is public property all along here. The bike path I use to go into, into downtown is along the river here. So we are helping to upgrade the well-being of the Greenway. The city doesn't have the time and the budget to do what needs to be done. So different people in the neighborhood have adopted bits and pieces of the Greenway to look after. And this is in complete uh, cooperation with the city. The city is a great partner for this. Uh, my part is I look after the Filbert Grove. This is the Filbert Grove. It's a 65 tree Filbert Grove on public property that uh, uh, 10 years ago was overgrown blackberries, uh, English ivy. And with cooperation, collaboration with the city, we are restoring the Filbert Grove. And this is another location. This is Razor Park. And another neighbor is the, uh, the ringleader for restoring this oak savanna habitat. This is more habitat restoration right here. Again, any neighborhood has some kind of, of location, public property that could use some attention, that could bring people together and everybody's literacy is enhanced by, uh, by this type of working together. Faith communities have an enormous amount of potential, and many, of course, already doing great work. This is a Lutheran church a few blocks away, and uh, they are uh, a, a new community garden has been put in on their property, and uh, many faith groups have property that can see uh, an improvement in how it's used that can benefit not only the congregation, but the wider community as well. Faith communities uh, should be part of the vanguard of creating a preferred future. So let's take a look at a few other places here in Eugene. This is Duma. Duma is a cooperative living uh, location in another part of Eugene. It's a large house. It's uh, three stories high, and there's a basement as well. And uh, the, uh, this is a 10 people live here, and it's intentional, cooperative uh, people uh, wanting to live together. They have uh, an existing literacy, and they recognize the benefits of cooperative living. Um, this is just one of my favorite places in Eugene. You can see this edible food forest landscape. It's got permaculture landscaping all around the solar panels. Uh, the, the cooperation uh, allows people in the community to uh, better make use of their time and their money. There's lots of amenities there uh, at Duma people couldn't afford to have on their own, but when people share resources, uh, lots of good things can happen. So Duma is one of my favorite examples of, uh, of uh, social literacy, reducing ecological footprints, uplift of the spirit. This is Matt and Jessica's place, uh, another neighborhood in Eugene, and they also have a suburban property. And over the past 15, 18 years, they've been making big changes uh, on their property as well. And of course, they've had thousands of people visit their property because they very actively host events and workshops 
about different aspects of ecological lifestyle. Uh, this is uh, one such event right here. There were 20 people there that day to learn about what uh, they're doing there on their property. A great example of suburban permaculture. Block planning is a tool that the city of Eugene recognizes. Uh, a block plan occurs when the people who live on a block and who own property on the block agree to making certain changes on the block. They have to do this together. And uh, the city has rules and regulations. There's a process to creating a block plan, but a block plan can allow for a more flexible and creative and ambitious repurpose of the built landscape and actually the social landscape as well. Uh, a block plan doesn't turn the block into a commune. Everybody still owns their own property. But when people work together to make a block plan, then the, uh, the process allows for a more creative reuse of the block in terms of landscaping, in terms of traffic, in terms of setbacks and heights. Uh, the, the block plan can be an enormously important tool for repurposing the, uh, the urban landscape. And one of my favorite places that illustrates what a block plan can look like is East Blair Housing Co-op uh, in another neighborhood here in Eugene. East Blair is home to about 50 people, is generally low income. The co-op owns about uh, eight properties and the co-op can manage those eight properties together in a coordinated way. And this is why it, uh, it manifests similar aspects of a block plan. East Blair is not a block plan, but what it shows uh, what a block plan can do. Uh, for example, uh, this is the tool room. People are working together. A block plan can bring people together to share resources. And at East Blair, they have a tool room and people in the co-op can check out all kinds of equipment they wouldn't be able to have on their own. Uh, this type of tool share could be possible uh, in any suburban neighborhood if the neighbors had the literacy, the awareness of the benefits to be gained by working with each other uh, and reducing their eco footprints and expanding their social cohesion. At East Blair, uh, some of the residential locations don't have space for a garden. Well, there can be garden space available at other parts of the co-op. Uh, this is one of my favorite scenes here is uh, this uh, beautiful edible landscaping. It's all nice and green. It's a party place. There's a fire pit. Uh, there's garden. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful location. This site right here I'm indicating used to be a parking lot. The parking lot was taken out in favor of this really affirming positive location. Uh, East Blair was able to do that. Uh, uh, and block planning could facilitate that kind of reuse of property as well. Uh, East Blair has a community room that the residents can use and they also make that available to the wider community uh, as well. Whoops, yeah, okay, here we go. And finally, this is the last the last location I'm going to show in Eugene, although there's dozens more, there's lots. Uh, this is another great example of people in a neighborhood who had the, uh, the awareness, the literacy to imagine what an unused city street right of way could be. The street was never built. This was just a grassy location between a couple of houses. Uh, the street grid just never made it to this particular location. Well, uh, the people there in friendly neighborhood 
recognized this would be a great place for a neighborhood garden. They went to the city. The city was cooperative, receptive, uh, told them you had to do this, you had to do that. Um, there were conditions and the, the people in the neighborhood uh, did what the city said they needed to do, check with neighbors and, and, uh, and other types of concerns. And within six months, this was happening right here. They were digging up the grass. And uh, this is a number of years later. It's a wonderful neighborhood garden. The neighbors manage this themselves. They have workshops. They have social gatherings. There's a, a neighborhood information kiosk. And I know people who have moved into friendly neighborhoods specifically because of this garden, because it's just such a wonderful a neighborhood amenity right there. Lots of neighborhoods have something that uh, could be their own version of a uh, common ground garden right here. So let's just go up the road, uh, I-5, about 100 miles to Portland. Portland, Oregon is just 100 miles north of Eugene. And certainly one of the most well-known entities in Portland in terms of uh, moving towards a preferred future is the City Repair Project. That is an entity, here's the website right here, cityrepair.org. The City Repair Project values the transformative power of the places we make and the living stories we share for a more just, inclusive, sustainable world. City Repair, collaborates with communities to cultivate and facilitate community-led, artistic, equitable, and ecologically oriented placemaking. Uh, that's straight from their website. Uh, these are different projects uh, that happen in the neighborhood that manifest people's care and concern about the neighborhood. It shows we care about where we live and when you remember that virtuous triangle of actions, allies, and assets, city repair is a great example of putting that, that type of social dynamic to work. Kyle Lash Eco Village uh, in Portland, uh, a, a wonderful story here. And again, here's uh, their website, kylelashecovillage.org. Uh, extremely well documented. There's lots of before and now images. The short story is that uh, this building here was a rundown apartment complex. A fourth of the units were unusable because they weren't being taken care of. There were drug shootouts in the parking lot and uh, a couple of people uh, with an enormous level of uh, social permaculture literacy recognized this wreck of an apartment complex could be turned into an eco village. And over the past 12, 13 years, that's exactly what they've done. They were able to buy the property next door. About 50 people live there. Uh, when you live there, you participate in the eco village. There's lots of different ways to participate. In effect, it's a live-in university for literacy to help uh, uh, people uh, gain the skills for helping to create a preferred future. Kyle Ash Eco Village. Uh, this is one uh, particular before and now image. Uh, this was, uh, in, the, in the early going, uh, a 20-car parking lot the parking lot was taken out and this beautiful garden was, was replaced the parking lot. This point right here being that point right there. Uh, you can think all over the United States, there are tens of thousands of similar locations where the parking lot could be taken out and a garden or some positive uh, community uh, a uh, plan could be made to make better use of that space. And I just, 
uh, really love Marisha and Zane. They live in Portland and live a permaculture lifestyle, reduced ecological footprint, uh, engagement with the community, making a living from their small suburban property, using bikes, uh, teaching permaculture. Uh, Mauritius, uh, website is permaculturerising.org. I'm sorry, permaculturerising.com. Uh, that is Mauritius website. But uh, the take home message is to recognize the opportunities that a small property presents and to make good use of, uh, of permaculture, that property, a set of ideals and principles and extend that literacy out to the wider community. Great story there. This is a, an economic development corporation in another part of, uh, of Portland in the Cully neighborhood. Let me just read a little bit from their website. Our 42nd Avenue is economic development by the community for the community. We are a collection of residents, business owners, local employees, commercial property owners, community institutions, and others who have partnered to ensure that economic change benefits the people of 42nd Avenue in a, an inclusive way. And this is a literate economic development project here. Uh, they are very ecologically minded, uh, local food production and, uh, and uh, nurturing small entrepreneurs who have uh, services to share with the wider community in a human scale. So uh, you can find out more. Uh, our 42nd Avenue, uh, look that up uh, online. Uh, our 42nd Avenue, Portland, Oregon, you can find their website and you can learn more. But suffice to say that economic redevelopment is critical for bringing about a preferred future. Businesses that are sensitive to the neighborhood, uh, businesses that provide products and services that help bring about a preferred future. Villages, Clark County is an entity that uh, exists to help elderly people age in place at home. That's a, a wonderful idea. Uh, here's a little bit from their website. Villages, Clark County is a grassroots organization of members and volunteers who believe in the power of community working together to enhance to enhance members' lives through personal connections, educational and social programs, volunteer services, and referrals so they can lead engaged, healthy lives. Well, I say this is great for uh, elderly people who would like to stay in their own homes and age in place. Uh, I would wanna do the same thing, but I see this village model could be applied to the larger community as well. Uh, it doesn't need to be only elderly people, but to bring in the entire community to, uh, to bring these kinds of services and engaging with the larger community. The model is there, this exists, and also in uh, uh, several hundred other types of villages uh, in other parts of the country. This is an awesome model that can be enlarged to include the entire neighborhood. That's uh, the story I see coming out of uh, Villages, uh, Clark County. Okay, let's go a little bit further out uh, to other parts of the country. Got some great stories here. Urban food systems, uh, I used to live in Houston, that's how I know Bob, and Bob uh, has been involved with this uh, uh, entity in Houston called uh, Urban Harvest, urbanharvest.org, and this is all about 
creating local food systems, community gardens, uh, farmers markets, a uh, big, huge tree sale, uh, classes, and youth education as well. So in Houston, uh, Urban Harvest is helping to increase the uh, the literacy of the entire city in terms of the importance of healthy uh, healthy food choices and producing more basic needs closer to where people live. It's a great story, Urban Harvest. And this is uh, Enright Urban Eco Village in Cincinnati. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a quick little break. I have somebody I need to say something to. Okay, give me about thirty minutes. I'm doing a recording right now. So go ahead and do what you need to do. I'll be in shortly. Yeah, I just can't stop this. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Had to uh, connect with somebody there. Uh, Enright Ridge Urban Eco Village in Cincinnati is a great example of taking an existing suburban neighborhood and increasing the literacy of everybody who lives uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, not everybody on the streets participates in the eco village, but people who want to, they do. And even people who don't participate uh, benefit by the eco village of people being more cooperative, sharing things, social, uh, economic, uh, mutual assistance and fun as well. Uh, Enright Ridge Urban Eco Village. This story from Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, this is Sunil. He is a suburban farmer. You can see this map right here, and it shows the different uh, properties that he has a, an agreement with the property owner to put that property into food production. This is a great story. And it's not to say it's been easy. Of course, I've spoken with Sunil about his project and it's not easy. You really have to be dedicated to making this happen. But the idea of turning suburbia into a, a much more important, important part of, of food production uh, many of us will realize that fact, but uh, Sunil is uh, working on farming suburbia. He has a website, patchworkurbanfarms.com, and he's also involved with a, a companion project about uh, uh, producing a directory of local people who produce uh, products and services that are local, that are healthy for people and planet. So you can find out more, patchworkurbanfarms.com. Syracuse, New York is the home of the Onondaga Earth Corps. And I'll read you just a little bit from their website. The mission of the Onondaga Earth Corps is to empower youth to be active participants in creating positive change for their communities and the environment. And these are some of the ideals. This is part of the program for the Onondaga Earth Corps. Uh, help youth understand the relationship between people and the natural world. This is building literacy right here. This is a great, this is all about literacy and empowerment for young people engage youth in hands-on community and environmental service learning projects, train youth for future jobs and careers and environmental fields, empowering youth. Uh, and these are, of course, pictures. Uh, their, their actions are about water quality, about community gardens, about planting trees, but just as important, learning the life skills uh, learning the literacy that, that is available 
for young people to uh, to put those skills to, to work in their own lives for their own benefit and for the well-being of the community as well. Uh, Onondaga Earth Corps, every city should have uh, this type of a of a an entity uh, to empower kids. Here's uh, another great story. The LA Eco Village. Uh, this is, of course, in Los Angeles, and uh, it is an urban eco village. This is where about 30 people live right here. Uh, they're involved with land trusting, with different types of community education projects, uh, LA Eco Village. Um, and of course, they have a website, laecovillage.org. And um, this particular project that I want to describe is, uh, resonates with me. I'm very much into uh, urban land use and transportation issues. So this resonates with me enormously. This here is the, the building of the eco village right here. And this on the corner just down the street is a uh, former gas station and automobile repair. It's empty. Uh, it was uh, disused uh, decades ago, uh, just kind of sitting there on the corner. Here it is actually right here. Well, the plan is to turn this former gas station car repair place into a neighborhood community center uh, with classes, with, with culture, with art, with uh, educational opportunities, uh, fun for the neighborhood. That's what the plan is, is to repurpose this, uh, this location right here. And then along with that, if that wasn't awesome all by itself, in Los Angeles, there's uh, a, a capacity for the city of Los Angeles to let people who uh, basically control a street uh, on this side of the street, on this side of the street, and as long as it doesn't adversely affect elsewhere, that the people uh, in certain circumstances can actually close the street to traffic, except perhaps maybe an emergency vehicle. But that's what the, uh, the plan is for this bit of street uh, next to where the eco village is, is to turn this street into a pedestrian plaza where events can take place, where it can be quieter, where the air might be a little bit better. But this is just a wonderful story for repurposing some of the uh, the urban landscape. Uh, the the uh, Lois Arkin, of course, and others had the literacy and the vision to see a potential here that's been there for decades, but now they realize they have uh, the tools to start working on turning this street into a pedestrian plaza. Well, there's lots of great stories uh, of all over the country. Uh, let's take a little bit of a, of a tangent here. These are great stories, particularly in relation to pushing back on cars. Here's a great story here, the Southwest Corridor in Boston. Um, the intention was to create a, an eight lane freeway from a ring road outside of, of Boston into downtown Boston. Uh, this would have been through uh, the Roxbury and Jamaica Plain neighborhoods. And the, the authorities were already buying property. They were already uh, removing and tearing down properties to make room for an eight lane freeway. And uh, at a point, the, the, the people in those neighborhoods gained the literacy to identify, we don't need, we don't want uh, to have this freeway going through the middle of our neighborhood and, uh, and to do something about it. They began to push back and ultimately the freeway was never built. 
I've been uh, along this uh, elongated park right here. Uh, this is a picture here. Uh, what would have been uh, an eight lane freeway is now uh, a four mile long corridor park with bike paths, community gardens, playgrounds, play fields. This is uh, what the, the citizens of Roxbury and Jamaica Plain have now instead of an eight lane freeway. Uh, there is also a commuter train uh, corridor here. There is a, a commuter train line that shares that corridor as well. Of course, that's good. Another image, this one uh, actually in Groningen, in Holland, uh, an existing town repurposed part of uh, their town. The, the downtown area is now car free. And say, for example, if you lived here and you wanted to go visit somebody here, you could walk or ride a bike and take a few minutes. If you wanted to drive, you had to go way out around this way um, if you want to drive a car. So uh, that would seem like, gee, that's kind of makes using a car kind of inconvenient. Well, that's the intention that's pushing back on cars. Doesn't say you can't have a car, but if you do, if you want to use it, this is this is how it's going to be inconvenient for you to use a car. That's a great story. Uh, this other uh, image here, again from Portland, Oregon, there was a four lane uh, divided highway along here. It wasn't the interstate, kind of predates the interstate, but along the Willamette River, prime real estate uh, for the community. The, a decision was made to take out the highway and the traffic engineers said, you're gonna have horrible traffic all over town because of that. They took out the, the highway and the, the traffic problems didn't uh, present themselves. There weren't any major traffic problems. So now instead of a, of a noisy uh, polluting highway, it's a, it's a park right along the Willamette River right there pushing back on cars. This image here, Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. Of course, most people are aware of Copenhagen is one of the leading cities in the world to facilitate alternatives to cars. And what this map here shows, these are bicycle freeways uh, from, the, from the suburbs give you scale. This is four miles. This is downtown. Of course, this is water right here. That's water. But this is four miles out. And this is nine miles out. So this is some of these are uh, seven, eight, nine, ten miles long. The whole intention is to make it as safe and convenient and uh, desirable as possible to get people to use their bikes instead of their cars. Uh, as much so as possible. Uh, this is showing these bicycle freeways like spokes going out from a wheel to facilitate alternatives to cars. And this location, uh, the Vauban neighborhood in Freiburg, Germany. This used to be a French military base uh, during the Cold War. And when the Soviet Union went away, the French army said, well, we're going away too. We don't need to be here anymore. So they moved out, but they left this big patch of land where the base used to be. So this patch of land was reimagined. It was redeveloped into a neighborhood that was designed specifically to have far less reliance on automobiles. So uh, that's what they did. There's a, a tram line, uh, there's lots of solar. It's uh, relatively high density, people living in three and four story apartments and, uh, and made to be safe to ride bicycles. You can still have a car if you want, if you live in the Vauban neighborhood, but if you do, you have to keep it in a city car garage 
some distance away and it's going to cost you $20,000 a year for the parking. Uh, that's kind of a discouragement for having a car uh, and very good. Uh, so uh, cars can still go in here, but only to visit or to make deliveries. So uh, I've got a few more pictures. This is the Vauban neighborhood. So we have uh, certainly higher residential density, uh, but then that allows for more open space. Uh, kind of uh, ironically, higher density can vastly improve quality of life, uh, greener open space. Uh, when we kind of go up a few stories, that makes uh, this kind of space more possible. Here's a picture that shows kids going to school. This would be the the, the tram line right here, lots of, of new solar installation there in the Vauban neighborhood. You could do a search Vauban, Germany on YouTube and you could find videos of this place. Paris, France is another emerging big city in Europe that's pushing back on cars. Uh, their mayor, Anne Hidalgo, a uh, very progressive mayor, just re-elected this past summer to be the mayor again of Paris. And a big part of her agenda is pushing back on cars. And this uh, uh, bit of artwork here gives a little bit, perhaps a little bit idealized, but something of an idea of, uh, of what a a neighborhood in Paris could become more like uh, with uh, far more friendly to people, uh, alternatives to cars, uh, 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 encouraging social activity, uh, encouraging economic activity as well. This image shows a, a nice sort of like, this is what Paris could be more like. And this is one of my favorite examples of pushing back on cars. This is Barcelona, Spain. And uh, about 12 years ago, the city of Barcelona began a what they call their urban mobility plan. Uh, the idea to improve air quality, to decrease the noise in the city. Barcelona is a very densely populated city, even by European standards. And uh, the need was to uh, a public health need actually is what is no pun intended is what is driving the urban mobility plan It's all about public health. Mm -hmm. So this is a super block right here and these are individual smaller blocks within the super block. Uh, this could be 20 to 30,000 people right here who live in the super block. The yellow lines indicate streets that are accessible for through traffic, where you could go from way over here to way over here on these streets. But the blue streets are only for uh, people and automobiles that reside within the super block. So that reduces the, the traffic immensely on these uh, uh, super block streets and they have to go slower too. And because there's less pressure by automobiles that vary a great deal of the, the surface area of these streets can be repurposed to something else besides cars. So take this intersection here and we go over here and that's what the intersection would look like uh, before the super block. And this is the transition. Actually, uh, the super block new intersection can become a playground, uh, could become a park, uh, certainly much more pedestrian oriented, much more bicycle friendly. So this is a, the transformation. The cars can still go along here in one direction on the periphery. They have to go really slow. Uh, and this is, of course, all protected from uh, any automobiles, but only local traffic and, and have to go really slow. And this is what 
that particular intersection could look like in the early going of the transformation uh, they're learning as they go along. But this would have been a busy street intersection and now it's play space. And of course, this will become more refined over time. This is an early intervention. But this could have been a, a busy street at one point. Uh, this could have been a busy street at one point. You can see there are still some cars here, but not so many as there used to be. And of course, part of the mobility plan is to make better use of Barcelona's existing transportation assets, and that includes buses, commuter trains, and a uh, underground metro. So uh, it's a larger plan. They have to address issues of uh, gentrification. There's lots of concerns here. This isn't like it's happening by magic. This takes a lot of work, and it's a work in progress, but this is the most ambitious. Uh, example of pushing back on cars that that I know of. Okay, I have one more topic that I want to address here. This will uh, just about three or four slides right here, but this is uh, important as well. How do we take a preferred future, these ideas, this literacy, how do we take this out to the wider world? Well, to me, the point of departure is of system change, there's a common denominator to almost every progressive organization uh, in the country, uh, a common denominator. We know all sorts of uh, nonprofits working on environmental issues, political, economic issues, public health, uh, social issues. Virtually every one of these problems that these great organizations are working on are problems caused by capitalism and the consumer culture. Uh, recall the, the earlier slide we saw about disequity, about pollution, uh, about uh, these different problems that capitalism uh, has delivered to us. So the common denominator is virtually all these entities are addressing problems caused by capitalism and the consumer culture. That means these organi organizations have a lot in common. Uh, the, they could be working a lot more closely with each other. And one of the actions all these groups could take would be to help include, improve the literacy of their own membership to issues beyond the, the issues that entity is specifically addressing. So what that means is that these entities could put out in their newsletters, on their websites, and however they communicate with their membership and the wider world. Uh, for example, the Sierra Club has a, a wonderful, nice magazine that goes out. The Sierra Club has three and a half million members just say the Sierra Club puts out information to uh, enhance their membership's literacy, but it's not only environmental issues, it's political, public health, social issues as well. And along with that kind of education, all these different organizations, and here's a list of, of many of them, these uh, different different categories, all these organizations could be explaining to their membership, here are some actions you can take in your own life to address these issues. And those actions will help us do our work better. And of course, imagine all these different entities uh, advocating to their membership to reduce their ecological footprints, to uh, become engaged with their neighborhood associations, um, to make use of city programs in a more ambitious way. All these organizations could be, I think, much more empowered to empower their membership, uh, not only to say, here's the problems, but here's actions that can help address those problems. And of course, these entities here 
are uh, more in the street kind of entities, uh, Native American issues, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, climate change. All these movements could encourage their memberships to downsize their eco footprints and to uh, make use of the allies and assets they have available where they live. So that's in, in a short, uh, uh, small bit of, of education right there. I go into more detail about uh, this issue uh, in other presentations that I have, but that's, a, that's the, the main features right now of, of getting uh, uh, healthy, literate information out to a wider audience. So there's different takes on American exceptionalism, and I'm all for certain aspects of American exceptionalism. Uh, my version of American exceptionalism is people manifesting who they are in a positive way for the well-being of people and planet. And I just can't think of better things for people to do than to volunteer in the community to make the community a better place to live. There's all kinds of issues and actions, uh, something for everybody uh, for helping to make the community a better place to live. And, and you've seen a lot of those types of uh, examples of improving and making the community better uh, here in this presentation. So the, the multiple benefits, uh, permaculture, one ideal of permaculture is uh, design for multiple benefits. How can we get the most good out of our actions? And uh, bringing about a preferred future is uh, delivers, can deliver a lot of benefits. And of course, this doesn't have to be in the future either. Uh, as you saw with all these images, a lot of people in a sense, are already spending part time in a preferred future. I know I am. I look out my window. I look where I am right now. This is already a little bit of that preferred future. A greater resilience, a good for local economy and small business. Uh, uh, encourage positive human potential, uh, safer, more prepared, secure future, good for the environment. Uh, mitigate climate change, benefits to public health, uh, build a positive community culture closer to home. Let me just add one item that a large part of our economy exists to repair the damage caused by other large parts of our nation's economy. If we don't buy the products that cause damage then we don't spend the money on those products. And then the second part of that is we don't have to spend trillions of dollars repairing the damage those products cause. Imagine investing that money, that time, both at the personal level, but at society level, investing the time, that money, those resources in a preferred future. Uh, I do that here on my own quarter acre property and all these images that you saw, they're doing their own version of making uh, priorities, smart choices with what they do with their time and their money. Okay, this is the last image. Uh, you can find links to my podcasts uh, and YouTube presentations on my website, suburbanpermaculture.org. And these are the URLs of the first two presentations in this three-part series. That is what I have to offer. Uh, thank you for uh, your being here. Feel free to uh, share this info with others and, and pass on the, uh, the web, uh, the URL address so other people can see this video as well. I know it's long, it's a lot, but great information. We're talking about increasing literacy for a preferred future. Okay, thanks. <laughs>